future. Midnight in Athens, journalists at the newspaper Ephemeride Don Sigtakton, Efsin for short, finalizing tomorrow's front page. This is a publication unlike any other in Greece. It's run as a cooperative. Everyone around this table owns a share of the paper. Many of them pulled together personal funds to launch it four years ago. Editors are voted in, and everyone gets paid the same. Apart from the director, Nicolas Moulelis, he came out of retirement to invest his time in this project for free. So when FSIN's journalists say they have a personal investment in their stories, they mean it quite literally. FCN, the journalist journal, this is the exact translation in English, is an independent paper with no ownership, with no a magnate behind, no party behind, no government. It is a collective property. FCN is an experiment. It's difficult sometimes because we had no previous experience and it's hard to be a journalist and a proprietor at the same time because we are all part of every single process, from the production to the printing to the delivery. Traditionally, a Greek newspaper would be owned by a wealthy businessman with various interests and traditionally the newspaper would be seen as a vehicle to exercise political influence, to gain contracts. So now for someone to come along and say actually what we're going to do is that all the people who work here are going to own the newspaper and make the decisions together really uh, you know, turns that model on its head. Greece is a small country of 11 million people. Until recently, it had an outsized media sector, 39 national dailies, 23 national Sunday papers, and eight national TV channels. But since the financial crisis hit in 2009, the economy has shrunk by a quarter, advertising has slumped, and, like other countries around the world, the media bubble burst, only in Greece, the media implosion was much worse than elsewhere. The entire sector witnessed an unprecedented disaster. Television stations and newspapers shut down. And as the crisis got deeper, you'd have expected Greek society to support the media, since people would want to stay informed. Yet the circulation of Sunday papers fell by 500,000, while TV viewership also plummeted. First, a very large newspaper closed, Elefteros Tipos. Then, a second newspaper, Apogev Matini, closed. But journalists didn't really realize what was happening. Then, at the beginning of the crisis, a very large TV channel, Alter, and a very large newspaper, Elefterotipia, shut down. That was the beginning of the end of a whole era. What we were left with was scorched earth. The closure of Eleftherotipia, Greece's second most widely read paper, came as a shock. The paper had been a symbol of what Greeks call metapolitefsi, a new phase of Greek democracy after a seven-year dictatorship that ended in 1974. Back then, the media lacked credibility because most newspapers had supported the regime. In 1975, Eleftherotipia was published for the first time after journalists got together and mobilized. It started as a newspaper managed by its employees, journalists, but it didn't work financially. So it was replaced by the more traditional businessman, publisher, employer model. Yet journalists kept the right to express their opinion. The paper stood out for this until the very end. The only difference at Eleftherotipia was that the editor remained an editor. He didn't own ships, he didn't build roads or take on public works contracts. But this could also have been one of the causes of the paper's collapse. Because Eleftherotipia took a critical stance against the bailouts, while at the same time depending on banks. Eventually, the banks refused the paper liquidity, something like 11 million euros. When you consider that there are media outlets here whose debts amount to half a billion euros, what happened to this paper was not coincidental. Once Eleftherotipia closed shop, journalists from the paper came together to try and recreate its original vision, a publication run by its journalists. In three years, the paper circulation figures have climbed by 30%. 
as others have fallen by roughly the same rate. And if since weekend sales are second only to the country's leading national paper, Danir. Many say that's because the paper has ignored the red lines. Other mainstream outlets are too compromised to cross. It's not that newspapers in Greece don't cover things, they do. But ever since the financial crisis of 2010, it would have been the media's role to hold government and business to account. But people here see journalism as just part and parcel of what they call an unholy alliance, a triangle of power between government, business and the media. It was the leftist Syriza government that coined that term, unholy alliance. When they came into power at the beginning of 2015, they vowed to dismantle it. Just this month, the government cut the number of national TV channels from eight to four in a move they say will cut down on corruption and better regulate the market. Traditionally, uh, the Greek media was built around political alliances and one of the big criticisms of the way that uh, newspapers operated was that they supported one political party or the other and that when that party was in power it returned the favor by uh, granting advertising, granting state contracts to owners who also happened to own public works. The Greek media were already in a series of crises before the crisis. There was an economic one and a crisis of public trust. During the bailouts, the media chose to support austerity policies. The policies that led to over one million people losing their jobs, 2.5 million left with no access to the National Health Service, around half a million young people forced to emigrate. The media, journalists, betrayed the citizens. In 2013, Dina Daskalopoulou spent three months in Skouriers in northern Greece after protests erupted there over a Canadian multinational mining project. That reporting was scant elsewhere came as no surprise. Greece's largest construction group, which jointly ran the mining projects, is owned by Georgios Bobolas. Greeks call tycoons like him part of the entangled because he also owns multiple mainstream media outlets in the country. In this case, we gave locals the voice that they had been deprived of. We also frequently refer to issues that our advertisers may not necessarily like. For example, the pollution generated by the Hellenic petroleum refineries. We've made it clear that advertisers' interests will not be intervening in our stories, no matter what. EFSIN actually excels in certain types of stories, mainly social ones which are now absent from mainstream media. Stories on migrants, education, refugees. I think that this is why EFSIN circulation has risen. But we need to make sure that this lasts and that's going to take a lot of persistence. Because in Greece, a disentangled kind of journalism, journalism not owned by corporations or dictated to by them, journalism that looks to represent the voices on the margins, that kind of journalism is in high demand, but in short supply.